Okay. Show me. Sometimes that is better. Welcome to the Prairie Land Paranormal Podcast. Be sure you never, ever scream. A podcast where we will explore the dark corners of our world, the weird, the creepy, and the strange. There are no accidents, no coincidences. I am your host, Eric Carrier. The boogeyman is real. And they mostly come at night. My co-host is Jessica Carrier. Thank you for joining us for a journey into the unknown. Be one of us. Let's get started with today's show. Hey guys, welcome to the show. If you don't know where you're at, this is the Prairie Land Paranormal Podcast, and I am your host, Eric Carrier. As always, I am here with my wife and my co-host, Jessica Carrier. Jess, what do we have in store for our listeners today? Today, things are going to get weird. We're going to be looking at a variety of strange things that have fallen from the sky. Things like blood, jelly, and cows. Cows? That's right, cows. That's utterly preposterous. (laughs) (laughs) So are you. Trust me when I say we're going to introduce you to some truly unusual weather occurrences. Then, stick around after the break and we'll discuss some of the theories and scientific explanations for these types of strange phenomena. So stick around, strap on your seatbelts, and be prepared to enter the strange world of weather. All right, folks. If you are a new listener and you are here for the first time, welcome. If you've been around for a while, welcome back. We know that there are a lot of podcasts out there that are competing for your time, and we are grateful that you are giving that time to us. Jessica, how can folks help support our show? If you'd like to support our podcasts, and we know you do, here are a few ways that you can do that. First, please share and keep sharing the show. This is by far the most important thing you can do to help our show continue to grow. Also, please remember to keep voting for us in the Paranormal Top 25 and as the best new podcast of the year. Both of those contests are sponsored by Paranormality Magazine, and you can vote for us at paranormalitymag.com. Voting for the best new podcast of the year ends on September 30th. That gives you only a few more days. Another way to support our show is to check out our merch store. Or consider leaving a tip or a review. And lastly, you can come hang out with us on social media. We have accounts on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, and love to hang out and meet you guys there. All of those accounts and our merch store can be accessed through our website at www.prairielandparanormalpodcast.com. Jess, is there anything else? Nope. Okay, let's get started with today's show. The old adage, it's raining cats and dogs, may not be so far from the truth. While there are no actual accounts of cats or dogs falling from the skies, animals falling from the sky and other weird weather phenomenon are absolutely real. So let's take a look at some of the weird things that have fallen from the skies, starting with animals. Accounts of animals mysteriously falling from the skies aren't rare. Just a quick search will show many reports occurring just over the last decade. But this isn't a new phenomenon either. Perhaps one of the earliest reports is from the first century Roman naturalist Pliny the Elder, who mentioned rainstorms of frogs and fishes in some of his writings. There are also reports from 1794, when French soldiers reported that toads fell from the skies in Lillane during a heavy rainstorm. The most common type of animal fall appears to be fish and amphibians. The last five years alone, there have been reports of raining fish in Australia, the Philippines, and two different regions in India, while frogs have fallen as far as Japan and Hungary. This report from Japan involves tadpoles falling from the sky in June 2009. Quote, Clouds of dead tadpoles appear to have fallen from the sky in a series of episodes in a number of cities in the region since the start of the month. In one incident, a 55-year-old man who was caught in a tadpole downpour described hearing a strange sound in the parking lot of a civic center in the city of Nano. 
Upon further exploration, he found more than a hundred dead tadpoles covering the windshields of the cars in the area measuring 10 square meters. Dead tadpole downpours were also reported by local officials 48 hours later in the city of Hakusan, in the same prefecture, end quote. And this one from Australia in 2010, quote, It rained fish in Lojamanu on Thursday and Friday night. They fell from the sky everywhere. Locals were picking them up off the footy oval and on the ground everywhere. These fish were alive when they hit the ground. I haven't lost my marbles. Thank God it didn't rain crocodiles. <laughs> End quote. La Jamanu has previously reported fish falls in 1974 and in 2004. The tiny white fish were most likely spangled perch and fell by the hundreds. While hundreds may sound like a lot, that's nothing compared to what fell in Marksville, Louisiana in 1947. The Louisiana Department of Wildlife Biologists, A.D. Bodkov, offered this account, quote, There were spots on Main Street in the vicinity of the bank, a half block from the restaurant, averaging one fish per square yard. Automobiles and trucks were running over them. Fish also fell on the roofs of houses. I personally collected from Main Street and several yards down Monroe Street a large jar of perfect specimens and preserved them in formalin in order to distribute them amongst various museums. End quote. The most extraordinary claim of fish falls comes from Euro Honduras, where Luvia de Pisces, or fish rain, has been reported to happen up to three times a year for over a century. A member of Seattle University's International Development Internship Program offers one of the few available English language accounts of this phenomenon from his travels in Honduras back in 2006. Quote, A massive storm hits the surrounding countryside of the village with swirling winds and thick pouring rain. Out of nowhere appear dozens of live fish right from on the fields flapping in the rainwater. The locals believe this to be a miracle from God, finding no explanation other than fish falling down from heaven. In the 1970s, National Geographic sent a few professionals to report on this world wonder. They discovered that all the fish were approximately the same size, around 6 inches, and completely blind. They identified the species but found no record of it in any surrounding bodies of water. Their theory was that these fish are from underground rivers, never exposed to light and thus blind. How they came to appear every August with a storm is still a mystery." End quote. The extraordinary event of Luvia de Pisces has attracted the attention of scientists as well as documentary coverage by the History Channel. While fish and frogs seem to be the norm, there have been some reports of mass bird falls as well such as in San Luis Obispo, California, where a large-scale bird die-off occurred in 1976. On the morning of November 24th, a street sweeper found hundreds of dead blackbirds and pigeons lying in the town's downtown area. The event lasted for two days, with the citizens of San Luis Obispo witnessing intermittent showers of dead birds. Birdfall occurred twice in one year in BB, Arkansas in 2012 where about a hundred blackbirds fell from the skies. Horace Taylor of Animal Care and Control and BB reported that, quote, well, there was just birds falling down on the street and people dodging and missing them. And we were down the street picking them up. We got called out by the chief and we all came and tried to pick them up off the street, end quote. Another unusual animal to fall from the sky was bats. This was the case in Campbelltown, Australia in 2018 where it rained boiled bats. Boiled? Yes, boiled bats. If you stick around after the break, we'll explain how that's possible. Well, if you're going to have boiled bats, why not frozen iguana? Tallahassee, Florida experienced this when unusually cold weather caused frozen iguanas to fall from their perches in trees. This has occurred twice, both in 2018 and 2020. I think most of us are glad cows can't fly. Or can they? In 1997, a Japanese fishing boat crew was pulled from the Sea of Japan 
after barely surviving a cow torpedo. The crew told their story to officials on land who quickly arrested them for their tall tale. They claimed a cow had fallen from the sky and struck the ship, resulting in a huge hole and its rapid sinking. Other occurrences of strange animal falls have included jellyfish reported in Bath, England, worms in Jennings, Louisiana, octopus in China, and perhaps the most disturbing, spiders, which reported, guess where? Australia. Yep, Australia, home of all things deadly and terrifying, including falling spiders. (laughs) I kind of find it funny that when I was reading up on this report, people in Australia were just like, oh yeah, it's kind of annoying to have spiders in your beard and your hair. They didn't even phase them. I'm not sure what it would take to phase an Australian, but uh, I don't know that I want to know either. (laughs) They're pretty tough. While animal falls have been the most common, there are a few really strange falls that have occurred. One of these is the Kentucky Meat Shower, which occurred in 1876. The whole thing is so bizarre that if it hadn't been reported in an issue of Scientific America, it probably would have been relegated to legend. As the story goes, Miss Crouch, a farmer's wife, was making soap on her porch when she reported seeing meat pieces falling from the sky. She said she was about 40 steps from her house when the meat started to slap the ground. The meat looked grisly, according to Miss Crouch, and her husband believed the event signified a sign from God. Most of the pieces were approximately two by two inches. At least one was four by four inches. The meat appeared to be beef, but according to the first report in Scientific America, two gentlemen who tasted it judged it to be lamb or deer. Well, there's some tough men that are going to eat weird meat off the ground. Or hungry men, I guess. I guess that's just what they do in Kentucky, though. <laughs> <laughs> Here is an excerpt of that report. Quote, On Friday, March 3rd, 1876, flakes of meat fell over an area a hundred yards long and fifty yards wide, near the Kentucky home of Mr. and Mrs. Allen Crouch, not far from the Olympian Springs in the southern Bath County. The sky at the time was cloudless. The flakes were from one to three or four inches square and looked like fresh beef. However, according to the opinion of two gentlemen who tasted it, The substance was either mutton or venison. B.F. Ellington, a local hunter, identified the meat as bear, and Leopold Brandis thought the substance was nostoc, a type of cyanobacteria. Brandis gave a sample of the meat to the Newark Scientific Association for further analysis, leading Dr. Alan McLean Hamilton to declare the meat to be lung tissue. His identification of the meat was grisly, declaring it was either horse or an infant. Several other samples were analyzed and Dr. Hamilton's assertion was backed up, with two samples of the meat being identified as lung tissue, three as muscle, and two as cartilage. Thankfully, a horse was deemed the prime suspect and baby rain was put to rest. But still, exactly how a horse got up in the sky and turned into a bunch of meat globs remains a mystery. Blood rain, or red rain, is a phenomenon in which blood is perceived to fall from the sky in the form of rain droplets. Occurrences of blood rain throughout history have occurred both anciently and in modern times. The earliest literary instance is in Homer's Iliad, in which Zeus twice causes a rain of blood. Before the 17th century, it was generally believed that the rain was actually blood and was considered a bad omen and this belief persisted through the Middle Ages and well into early modern period. It was used as a tool for foreshadowing events, but while some of these may be literary devices, some occurrences are historic. In Europe, there were about 30 recorded cases of blood rain in the 13th through 15th centuries. There were 190 instances recorded in the 16th and 17th centuries. There was a decline in the 17th century when only 43 were recorded, but this picked up again in the 19th century with 146 accounts. The phenomenon 
received international coverage in 2001 in Kerala, India, where multiple heavy rainstorms produced mostly red rain, although yellow, green, and black rain was also said to fall. This occurrence happened again in 2012. If there is blood rain, then it makes sense that there is orange snow. One such case is orange snow that fell over parts of Siberia back in January 2007. The Guardian describes the event, quote, When locals in the small village of Padunskoy woke up on Wednesday, they immediately noticed something rather strange. The snow falling from the sky was orange. In fact, three regions of southern Siberia, a vast area of industrial towns, pine trees, and the odd bear, today reported the same mysterious phenomenon. Not only was the snow not white, it also smelt bad. Most of the snow was orange, but some of it was red and yellow as well. Officials confirmed after scrambling to the affected areas to dig up samples, and it was also oily, they discovered." End quote. I don't know about you, Eric, but my parents always warned me about yellow snow. Oh, definitely. Never eat yellow snow. That was definitely something my parents taught me. <laughs> but I'm also going to say don't eat red snow, yellow snow, black snow, or any of these other weird snows that <laughs> are falling on the ground in Russia. Another strange phenomenon is angel hair. Nope, not the pasta. Angel hair or siliceous cotton is a sticky, fibrous substance reported in connection with UFO sightings or manifestations of the Virgin Mary. It has been described as being like a cobweb or a jelly. As described by those who have claimed to have observed it, angel hair occurs in the form of wispy strands of a substance falling from the sky without a ready explanation. Some claim they are the signs of angels or aliens, while others are eager to blur the distinction and say the hair is from angelic aliens. The phenomenon has been reported all over the world, and one of the hallmarks of the wispy stuff appears to be that the feathery strands like to evaporate before anyone can actually analyze or study them. This, unfortunately, leaves mostly eyewitness accounts with little scientific backing of truth. UFO researcher and pilot Brian Boldman conducted a major review of angel hair in 2001 citing the existence of 225 cases of angel hair between 679 AD and 2001. Boldman's contention is that these events are potentially extraterrestrial events. He based this argument on the fact that according to his research, 57% of angel hair cases involve UFO reports, a significant number which strongly links the two phenomena. While Boldman doesn't explain how angel hair may relate to UFOs, other ufologists have attempted to explain their relationship. These paranormal experts argue that angel hair is ionized air sleeting off an electromagnetic field created by a UFO. Nonetheless, the lack of clear testing of many of the cases has meant conspiracy theories have flourished, including the belief that angel hair is proof of chemtrails. Perhaps one of the strangest phenomena is star jelly. Star jelly, also called astromixin or astral jelly, is a gelatinous substance that has been found on grass or on trees. Star jelly gets its name from medieval folklorists who claimed that this gooey, jelly-like, grayish-white translucent substance appeared after meteor showers. Of all the mysterious aspects of star jelly, perhaps the strangest is the fact that it evaporates soon after appearing. The first recorded reference to star jelly is an excerpt from Josh Gaddison in his 14th century medical journals. He called it a certain mucilaginous substance lying upon the earth. Star jelly goes by many names, including star falling, star shot, star slime, and even moon excrement an undefinable substance that falls to the earth during a meteor type event sounds like the beginnings of a classic horror movie in fact a 1950 encounter with star jelly by four philadelphia policemen inspired the 1958 movie the blob 
the officers reported the discovery of a, quote, domed disc of quivering jelly six feet in diameter, one foot thick at the center, and an inch or two near the edge, end quote. When they tried to pick it up, it dissolved into an odorless, sticky scum. The enduring mystery of star jelly continues to inspire Hollywood. In the 1978 film Invasion of the Body Snatchers, alien spores fall to Earth in a rain shower and form blobs of jelly that grow into flowers that produce the seed pods. The most recent sighting of star jelly was in Goochland County in Virginia. In June 2019, a couple found five small piles of strange crushed ice-like substance, but gelatinous in nature. All right, folks, if you will stick around after the break, we will be back to discuss some of the scientific explanations for some of these different types of animal falls and for these other types of weird weather phenomenon. looking for a new adventure? Did you ever want to visit the city where all your nightmares reside? Well, you're in luck! Join us, your tour guides, Christine and Jen, to visit Nopeville, where you will be personally escorted on an all-inclusive trip through the city and see all possibilities of terror and fright. You'll see all sorts of things on your tours, including, but definitely not limited to, the paranormal, true crime, the supernatural, and more. If you're into all that and enjoy a little dark humor, book your tour today and nope right along with us. Check us out on our website at nopevillepodcast.com to see where you can listen to Nopeville today. Right, folks. So that was our research into weird weather phenomenon and strange animal falls. Jessica, this reminds me of a few years ago when our boys were out at their bus stop and found a random fish lying in the ditch. Yeah, it wasn't a very big ditch at all, but it was a huge fish. And strangely enough, it was still alive. And we don't live next to a large body of water. Well, we live within about 10 miles of a lake, but... That's 10 miles. Yeah, but uh, 10 miles is a very long way for a fish to travel on its own. Especially without any streams or rivers to bring it anywhere. I don't remember if it had any wounds or like talon marks on it. Do you recall? I don't think it did. And they even brought it to one of the school teachers who was kind of interested in things like that. And it just appeared to be a normal fish, but it did die soon after. Yeah, it was strange. And I remember our boys for a few days, as they had this fish alive in a bucket, were like, how did it get there? And we postulated some possible answers to that. And Jess, do you remember what some of those were? I think it had stormed recently before the fish showed up. So we thought, well, maybe it had like been picked up in a storm or something. <laughs> well... We didn't really consider, because of its size, that the wind or the weather carried it here. We assumed that because the ditch had water in it still, that it may have somehow been brought in here by the currents in the sewer system. Yeah, something like that. We also considered that it may have been dropped there by a bird, and it just happened to fall into a ditch full of water. Yeah, in fact, in the same spot, yesterday, I saw a hawk just standing there. So maybe it is a place where big birds come. Come to wash their dinner before they uh, chomp it up? Yeah, I don't know. I I don't (laughs) know why I wouldn't continue to eat it. Maybe a car scared it away or something. I don't know. Either way, it was kind of strange and it was weird to find that random big fish just sitting off the side of the road like that. Yeah. So you may be like us asking yourself what could possibly be causing all of these animal types of falls from the sky. Well, it turns out that most of these occurrences have a very normal, natural, and even sometimes comical explanation. The good news is is that most of these things are not paranormal or apocalyptic in nature. They're really just strange or unusual. So let's start with fish and amphibians. Jessica, what are some of the scientific 
explanations as to why fish or amphibians may fall from the sky? For me, this is actually one of the easiest things to explain, considering fish and amphibians are water creatures, and if they're going to fall from the sky, you know, rain, it kind of connects there. But there are some different philosophies or different theories that people came up with. One was from French physicist André-Marie Ampere. Ampere was already well known in the scientific world for discovering electromagnetism and thus lending his name to the unit of electric current. He offered the first known hypothesis of why frogs in particular could suddenly fall from the sky. He suggested at a meeting of the Society of Natural Sciences that a sudden gust of violent wind could lift large groups of frogs high into the air and when the burst of wind dissipated, they would rain back to the ground. Well, as it turns out, Ampere was mostly correct as the current most favored explanation for why animals, particularly fish and amphibians, rain down at times is due to water spouts and or tornadoes. These tend to form over bodies of water and as a result, they suck fish up, they suck frogs up, and they transport them until a time in which the tornado or water spout dissipates, and the result is fish and or frogs raining down on a town. I guess I don't know much about water spouts, but I kind of always assumed that they only were over uh, like oceans, that they didn't go over, over other large bodies of water. But it sounds to me like maybe they could be over other bodies of water. Well, I'm no tornado expert, but I think that a tornado that either forms over water and or crosses over water can technically be considered a water spout. So that means this could happen anywhere tornadoes happen or anywhere tornadoes could cross over water. Yes, absolutely. There are two mysteries that still kind of surround this hypothesis, however. Yeah, I thought about at least one of them, and that was why only scoop up one species of fish or why only scoop up tadpoles? You think that if that were the case, there would be a variety of different species of animals and plant life that would land. Yeah, that is strange. I mean, it seems that water spouts and or tornadoes, they can't really discriminate like that. And the only way that that really could happen is if these animals were living in such a tight distribution, which is possible, but that's really not how nature works. Animals tend to spread themselves out a bit. I will admit, however, that for fish, I mean, they do tend to travel in schools, so that makes that a bit more plausible in my mind. Yeah, it also kind of weird that people aren't seeing what's happening. They aren't seeing this big water sprout or tornado just dropping things from the sky. They're just appearing. You think that if it were the situation where this water spout came up, that people would see it, they would witness it, because people have seen water spouts come up on land and drop things. So why are they not seeing this, and why is it all of a sudden just raining down from the sky without any explanation? Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, most of these occurrences have been associated with large storms, but they're not necessarily associated with records of water spouts and or tornadic storms. It's definitely one of the mysteries that still surrounds this theory. Also, some of the places where they have this occurrence aren't really near water. Yeah, like in our experience, our closest body of water that would have managed a fish of the size that we found in that ditch was 10 miles away. So the bird falls that occurred in San Luis Obispo and in Arkansas actually do have some explanation as well. The San Luis Obispo bird fall was thought to have been caused by some poison that was put out in a field. This was put out by the state specifically for the purpose of helping to control the bird population in that area. The citizens of San Luis Obispo obviously were not aware of that, which made this occurrence very strange and unusual. Weren't fireworks responsible for the situation in Arkansas with all the birds dying? Yes, the first incident was blamed on fireworks. The second incident that occurred there was not able to be tied to fireworks and therefore remains somewhat of a mystery. 
So I'm really curious about these boiled bats that you researched. <laughs> uh, please explain how boiled bats fell on this town in Australia. Well, in January of 2018, there was a huge heat wave that came through. And basically, it boiled the blood of these bats. It was too hot for them. And as they died, they fell to the ground in the hundreds. At first, I was like, January? That's kind of weird to have hot temperatures there. But I guess Australia is the opposite of the United States where we are. And so in January, it's their summer and it gets hot there. So do you remember from this story how hot the temperatures actually got? Yeah, up to 111.5 degrees, which in that area is way too hot for these flying fox bats. In fact, most of the bats that died were um, babies. Well, that is certainly a strange story, but not any stranger than the opposite, which seems to occur in iguanas. Yep. Apparently, iguanas don't do too well in the cold. And iguanas aren't indigenous to Florida. They're kind of an invasive species. So... They're used to the temperatures of South America. And when the temperatures dropped in Florida, so did they. Basically, their bodies shut down. They froze and became catatonic. So there was just these iguanas falling from the trees. And luckily, when their bodies heat up, they go back to normal. They're not dead when they're frozen. But it is kind of creepy having these lizards fall from the sky. Now, I think one of the craziest and possibly the one with the most comical explanation is the cow. You found this one as well, so please take it away. If you remember, a cow fell from the sky and basically torpedoed this ship in the Sea of Japan, causing the ship to sink. And the Japanese authorities pretty much put them in jail because they thought they were lying about what happened. Well, it turned out, after being imprisoned for several weeks, Japanese authorities were contacted by several highly embarrassed Russian Air Force officials who explained that the crew from a Russian cargo plane had stolen a cow that wandered near their Siberian airfield and forced it onto their plane before they took off for their flight home. Once airborne, the cow apparently panicked and started rampaging through the cargo hold, causing the crew also to panic because it was affecting the plane's stability. Basically, they solved the problem by shoving it out of the hold while crossing over the Sea of Japan at 30,000 feet, which literally turned it into a cow torpedo. (laughs) (laughs) What a random, weird event. Over all of the Sea of Japan, this cow comes crashing down on this ship Can you imagine being on the ship, seeing this cow just like drop? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so that is definitely the most comical reason for animals falling from the sky. Definitely. Turns out the Kentucky meat shower might be something kind of comical too. Eric, you're from Kentucky. Can you explain this to us? Well, I can assure you that this is something that doesn't happen often in Kentucky. And I'm certainly glad that they ruled out that it was baby meat because that would bring a whole new connotation to the word baby shower. (laughs) Definitely. (laughs) Just remember as I was reading this story, I was like, oh my gosh, please don't let this be baby meat. Please don't let this be baby (laughs) meat. That is going to be so gruesome. But the actual explanation is also somewhat gruesome because they determined that it was probably vulture vomit. Come again? Yep. Vulture vomit. It turns out that vultures, as part of nature, have developed a defensive mechanism to help them make quick escapes, and that mechanism is to vomit all their food up and fly away. And the funny thing is, I guess, is that when one vulture does this, all vultures in that party do the same thing. That still would have to be a lot of vultures. Yes, and that is an interesting point. Uh, The Scientific American article actually says this. It says... As a postscript to the story, Dr. Edwards relayed a theory of the event passed on to him by Mr. Parker. According to the local people of Kentucky, the meat was probably disgorged by buzzards, who, as is their custom, seeing one of their companions disgorge themselves, immediately follow suit. 
as to how many buzzards would be required to cover 5,000 square yards with disgorged meat, or at what height they must have been flying to be invisible was not suggested, end quote. But this still remains the foremost theory on how meat was able to shower over this couple's farm in Kentucky. I definitely wouldn't have been the guy tasting the meat. Oh, heck no. I'm not about to put any weird random meat in my mouth that's been found on the ground and no one knows where it came from. (laughs) Even for science. All right. So on to blood rain. Uh, Jessica, what uh, is the predominant theory as to what causes blood rain? I'm pretty sure that most people have figured out by now that it's not actual blood. It just appears to be blood. The Center for Earth Science Studies investigated the matter, and they decided that, based upon samples, there's two reasons for the red-colored rain. The first one was suspended dust particles dissolve salts or pollutants in the air. So basically, the rain mixes with these and then it comes down a different color. And the other was the presence of rapidly multiplying reddish algae that is called Protococcus fluvalis. And chemical analysis also showed the presence of a rust or meteoric dust. In the case of India, they only showed the algae and no volcanic or meteoric dust. So is this the same situation for the orange snow? Well, yes and no. So the first theory that was associated with the orange snow that was found in Siberia was completely focused on pollution. And it's uh, not hard to see why. I mean, Siberia is home to massive oil fields, chemical factories, and nuclear power plants. And the Russians used to do old Soviet nuclear war tests not far from there in Kazakhstan. So it was reasonable, I think, for locals in particular to believe that this was caused from pollution, but uh, it turned out to be something uh, completely different, really. Really? Yes, uh, something actually quite a bit more natural. Analysis from the snow actually showed that it was sand, most likely from the Sahara Desert. This was most likely stirred up as a result of sand storms, uh, was put up into the atmosphere, and uh, proceeded to mix with snow and fall over Siberia. So while there's a natural explanation for this, I'm still not going to eat orange snow, and neither should you. No, or yellow snow. Don't eat orange, yellow, brown, gray. Don't eat snow that's not white and or fresh. (laughs) (laughs) So there's probably also a natural explanation for angel hair. It's probably not related to UFOs or sightings of the Virgin Mary. This is also thought to be something caused by something very natural, something very normal, but also something very frightening. Jessica, what causes angel hair? Spiders. All right, so explain how spiders can create this effect. Basically, the angel hair is spider webs. Spiders do this thing called ballooning. They climb up to high areas, they stick their butts in the air, and they release silk. And this silk kind of makes a parachute that allows them to basically go in the wind long distances. You might remember this at the end of Charlotte's Web when the baby spiders are leaving. It's something that happens quite often, but sometimes this happens in the millions. Sometimes millions of spiders take off at once and cause this angel hair to fall over entire landscapes. And that's what's happened in Australia and Brazil. So basically, Australia and Brazil just need to be wiped off the face of the earth? (laughs) (laughs) If you're afraid of spiders, that is. Fortunately, the place this happened to in Australia, these spiders were pretty much harmless and they left after about a week. So even though it was kind of scary to have millions of spiders and spider webs coming down, it didn't last for a long time. Not a long time. That's a week. I don't want to live with millions (laughs) of spiders around me for a week. That sounds awful. Well, I guess if you live in Australia or Brazil and there's a lot of flooding where some spiders' habitats could be destroyed, go on vacation and don't wait around for the spider rain. (laughs) So while most of these things have a kind of natural and normal 
and or comical explanation, star jelly is one of those things that is really not explained very well yet. I think we're still figuring that one out. Well, it seems that science is also still trying to figure this one out because even in 1979, there was still the belief that this was extracellular organic matter, which exists as pre-stellar molecular clouds. Does that make any sense to you at all? Not really. Yeah, it's definitely above my head, but in simpler terms, they thought it was nebular goo. What that means, I still have no idea. I'm just going to go with the belief that this is lunar excrement. (laughs) (laughs) But part of the problem as to why we don't really know what this stuff is, is that it's been rarely examined or rarely collected. Yeah, it disappears, I guess, before you can collect it. There have been some samples that have been believed to be true samples and have been tested but they seem to be always inconclusive and they never show any DNA and can't be tied to either animal or plant life, which is where the majority of the explanations for this occurrence lies. So let's look at a few of these proposed explanations that don't include moon excrement. One idea was that it might be products of conception for frogs, toads, worms, or other creatures like deer. So in other words, what you're describing is basically sperm or oocytes from these different creatures? Yes, that was one theory. Another theory was that it was a type of uh, blue-green slime algae called nostoc. It's hard to see on the ground, but once it rains, it kind of swells up like the stuff in diapers. So it is kind of excrement. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) just not moon excrement. (laughs) These theories, however, really don't hold water in that when they did the DNA analysis, it came up back as neither plant or animal. So maybe it really is moon excrement. If you can't tie it to DNA, you can't tie it to animal, you can't tie it to plant. Maybe it does come from somewhere in the universe. If you don't know, everything's possible, right? Well, in that case, then maybe we need to be starting to prepare for an alien invasion. I don't know if we need to go that far yet. (laughs) Ultimately, it turns out that the jury is still out when it comes to star jelly. But if we're being honest, I don't think we need to start preparing for that alien invasion just yet. All right, folks, that is going to bring us to the close of this episode. As you can see, there are some truly strange and weird weather events that have occurred with some really strange associated types of falls. So, the next time that you hear about golf balls falling from the sky in Florida, sugar crystals falling from the sky in California, or rubles falling from the sky in Russia, all of which have occurred, please keep in mind that these strange events often have natural and not supernatural explanations. As for star jelly, we're just going to have to keep an eye on that one. If you've experienced any of these types of weird weather events or falls, please leave a comment or contact us via email. We would love to talk to you. All right, folks, that's going to do it for us. We will see you next time. All right, folks, that's the end of this episode. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you listening. If you have enjoyed the show, please consider subscribing through your favorite podcast player. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And remember that if you've had a paranormal experience that you would like to share, you can email us at prairielandparanormalpodcast at gmail.com, or you can submit that experience through our website at www.prairielandparanormalpodcast.com. So, until next time, remember... Don't be normal when you can be paranormal.